We're trying to cover the gamut tonight with various players, points of view, providers, payers, you name it. We're trying to cover it here tonight. Maybe you could tee us off here for the question that people will be uh, talking about at the tables, uh, which is, uh, well, we, re we revised the question slightly about value, but let me go ahead and ask the question that's here. Uh, and maybe you can tell us a little bit about you know, your thoughts a little bit about uh, what you're up to. Um, how much should we spend on health care? Well, we all know where to go for such. There's an authoritative resource for this, which of course is, is Monty Python. Uh, and uh, repeat it. We'll, I'll let you all finish it. Ready? We are all individuals. <laughs> Does anybody... <laughs> in the movie, they all go, we are, and it's, you know, like ACO care in, in Monty Python. We are all individuals. And then one little guy goes, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, we're all, we will all, you know, do our chronic disease fat farm together. You know, and we will all, you know, get nano and bio and then, pfft, I mean, Healthcare should cost as much as you want to spend on it. If you want to trick it out and, you know, go to the ladies and say, like, you know, I pay the Cadillac tax. Great. And if you want to buy a bigger house and die of cancer a little, 10 minutes earlier, my opinion is you should. Because my, my concern is that we don't, that when the demand curve doesn't work, you slow down the singularity. You slow down the automation and commoditization of the stuff we already know how to do, and you slow down the arrival of the things we don't know how to do. And it feels good because we're all locked hands being individuals together, but it's really bad, and it's not just bad for the elites, it's really particularly bad for the steam fitter who frankly can't afford it at its current price, and it's not being commoditized fast enough because of that inability, like how about we each decide how much we want to spend? And then healthcare providers will make it sexier and better and funner and cheaper to attract more people into the game. That was too long, so I'll stop. That was good. It's because you didn't know some very important Monty Python. <laughs> One line I didn't know from Monty Python, pretty extraordinary. Uh, John, you're next. Yeah, yeah let me take, take a, a crack at it. So, you know, in some ways, how much are we going to spend? What do we want to get for the money? I mean, in some ways, you can spend a whole bunch, but I, I'd make the argument we're not getting a lot in return. And, and again, a lot of my focus historically has been in, you know, looking at diabetes or chronic disease. So if you think of the traditional model, you go to the doctor maybe four times a year, you get a little bit of advice, you get some input, you get you know, your prescription renewed, and then the 361 days a year you're on your own, the presumption is you must be doing a good job, unless you're in the ED. So you know, I, I think the issue is it's really not how much we spend, but let's make sure we're spending those dollars intelligently and I think in the case of a chronic disease like diabetes, it's less about what actually happens at a hospital or a clinic. How do we help people manage that disease at home on their terms, give them the right mix of technology, give them the right, if you will, motivation, give them coaching, give them support, recognize the whole family's involved. And then I think we have an opportunity. We can spend the economics to really help people stay well, stay out of the hospital, avoid having complications, because right now we just kind of keep kicking the problem down the road. So instead of basically get ahead of the problem, focusing on health promotion, prevention, not allowing people that are at risk for diabetes to become diabetic, we just kind of keep letting them advance, increase their medications, ultimately put them on insulin. So the problem is I think we got to totally disrupt the way we're thinking about delivering value, helping people manage a condition, then you just kind of say, throw more dollars at it, and somehow that's going to fix the problem. Yeah. Juan? Look, I'm interested in this from a systemic issue, because the last thing a big empire does across history is to drive itself into bankruptcy. And three quarters of the countries in this world didn't exist 75 years ago. And, and the reason why countries drive themselves into bankruptcy is they, 
they often divide themselves to the point where they can't rationally divide, talk about stuff. And I get really pissed in these debates, not because I have the right answer, but because there's a series of people on this side that have the right answer, there's a series of people on this side that have the right answer, a series of people who have this side. And if you make one wrong statement, if you have one wrong declaration in a room, they will crucify you. And you will not be a part of that debate anymore. It's become such a politicized debate that we can't rationally have the question, why are we spending so much and not getting the outcomes we want? And why is it that in every sector of the economy, we're thinking faster, better, cheaper, except in the two that matter, which are education and healthcare? Because if these costs keep going up in the way they're doing, they're going to drive this country to bankruptcy. Right? The second thing is, if you don't educate people and get a better, faster, cheaper outcome on that, you're also going to drive the country to bankruptcy, and you're going to have to substitute with people that you educate or bring in that are migrants who are very smart, who substitute for the stuff you're not doing at the grammar school and public school level. So it's really important to depoliticize this debate, and it's really important to start applying some real metrics to this debate. And if we don't do that, the consequences are really serious. It's, it's not just about whether you survive six months more or less, or if you have this bill or you don't have that bill. These are absolutely fundamental things to the future of a nation. Do you, do you all agree with that? I mean, do, Jonathan, do you? I didn't get how much he thought we should spend. It says well, I think right he's there. He's thinking we're about to, sp we're on our way to spending too much. So less? Right? So, so I think. I mean, because I feel like some people want to yeah. spend more. I mean, and they do. They get fake parts, and you know, uh, it's okay. I, I just want them to be allowed to spend less too. Uh, you know, and and right now it's sort of illegal. You know, you get strapped in with everybody else to be individuals together, and I, I mean, I think that would allow, you know, would allow people to uh, feel a little more humanity with their health care. Uh, I mean, look, and it would get cheaper. I think. One of the outliers on that graph was the UK. And what the UK is doing is it's saying disability life years. So what's the value of a vaccine that prevents a deadly disease that you get at age two versus what's the value of a third heart transplant? Mm -hmm. And we're, we're the, look, think, think of what would happen if we worked on education in the same way as we worked on medicine until very recently. Okay? We will not pay for your preschool. We will not pay for your kindergarten. We will not pay anything for your elementary school. We will not pay anything for your grammar school, for your secondary school. We will not pay anything for college. But if you reach age 65, then we will pay for any education, regardless of outcome, regardless of what you study. Right? That is galactically stupid. We should be spending the most on this vaccine at this price will save this many years for this child. This much prenatal stuff. But, but that's not where you get for the research. That's not where you get paid for the procedure. That's not where you get paid. And that's not the stuff we fund, but that's the th stuff that will keep you alive for 70 years versus 70 days. But Juan, do you feel like people will act? That, that involves us being all rational the way you talked about in your comment. Uh, how, how's that going? That's why the politicization <laughs> of the... I just got right. back from New York. I was only halfway to Washington. And I could barely, you know. Yeah, to we told guys. them that they couldn't let us have our freedom I was so confused. I yeah. didn't even know what they were talking and about. And the death panels and the this yeah. and the that. And it, it, look, one phrase kills you as a member of this debate. And, and what's driving me nuts is if you spend billions of dollars in a year convincing people that the other side are baby killers, or the other side are nutcases that only carry guns, you're going to divide a country. And, and you're watching that with the Basques, and you're watching with the Catalans, you're watching with the Northern Italians, you're watching with the Southern Finns. These are dangerous things to do to a nation, particularly when you're talking about stuff near and dear to you like healthcare and education. You want to divide a country, you spend enough money, you'll do it. Because three quarters of those damn flags at the UN did not exist 75 years ago, and we've got to start depoliticizing the debates about stuff that truly matters to this nation, because we're going to destroy it. This so, so is there a solution here, John? I mean, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I'm depressed. Right. I, I, I'm glad I, I have feel insurance. Like these guys I mean. are actually living the solution. I mean, you know, talk about 3D printing of things that you know for pennies what cost millions of dollars or tens of thousands of dollars a few years ago. Talk about all the apps right, right. that you know the people that actually learn how to chronic manage diabetes and eat cake if they want. Right. Right. You know, and it's cheap. No, and, and, and I, I think, think that's, that's really the opportunity. I mean, we're at a point where. 
again, there's some really disruptive technologies. I mean, you know, Google basically announced a major initiative in diabetes, and their expectation is, you know, they can leverage their sensor expertise, their analytics, their cloud capabilities. And again, it's all tied into this idea of really providing personalized, individualized capabilities for people to help manage their condition. And, and the idea is essentially, if we really focus on helping people, guess what? They're going to have far fewer trips to the emergency room. They're actually not going to develop eye problems, kidney problems, vascular problems. So I think the real key is, you know, how do we appropriately leverage those technologies at the same time? You know, one of the fundamental issues in healthcare is, you know, getting clinicians to change. Uh, you know, it, it takes a while, you're going to have to work at it because, you know, their nature is, you know, they either want to see evidence-based, uh, you know, information or, you know, you've got to really work with them to change the way they do things because they're kind of wired that way. Yeah. And, and this is a really important debate for Boston, okay, because this is the center of the life science world. This is the place where most people are learning how to manipulate, read, write life code. There's three other centers in the United States. And, and that ability to understand how life is written is going to change every single business in this world. Remember the graduate, the movie? The, the most famous, well, I mean the most famous is the seduction scene, but the second famous one is plastics. Plastics! And that was the wrong word. The word Genomes! Genomes! Well, well, the word, I mean, you know, the problem with that advice is the guy ended up being a Tupperware salesman. But in 1967, when that movie was launched, Fairchild was making semiconductors, and Intel was founded in 1968. And if the word had been silicon, then that advice would have been very good for that college graduate. Now, what's the advice for a college graduate today? The advice is life code, because that's going to change every bloody business on this, in this world. And that's the kind of debate, and that's the kind of stuff we should be focused on. And, and to do that, we have to get past the, the fundamental basics of how much do you spend? What's rational to spend? How do you figure out this versus that? As opposed to making this a political food fight and ignoring the really big issues like, are we going to modify humans? But I just, how are we going to modify humans? It, I'm, so I had we're Ray Kurzweil this morning. He's wicked smart. <laughs> and uh, I'm told. Yes. And uh, <laughs> he's like, and then I said there'd be an internet, and then there was. And then, but I thought of you, and I thought of the life code thing. And, I, I thought of me, which I love doing, and <laughs> I, you know, 15 years to get 2% of America on Athena net, you know, 15 years banging on the door, and all of a sudden, like the next year, it's 3%. The next year, it's now we got more patients than the NIH in, in the UK. All of a sudden, you know, 15 years, no venture capital in digital health. None. In 2011, $895 million in all of digital health. And it was mostly to him, right? <laughs> Last year, what was it, four point on venture, or 4.4 billion at the end of 14? Very like, cool. Right, why? Because actually there's 69 million patients that you can zap into with an app, right? There's risk contracts that you can actually get the money if you zap into it properly. And then what I love is even outside of that, you've got this instrumented self movement, yeah. right? Which is getting everybody wired up on their own for their own sex drive, not financial reasons, which will equip them perfectly for when you're ready with the life code, right? You'll have these instrumented self people that none of them are sick today. So we really don't care what they do. The people who count their steps are not the ones showing up at Jocelyn. <laughs> right. But there, you can see this convergence where established big med is getting onto the cloud, not because they want to, but because they're going under and they need you know, more cash. And then you've got this fashionable, healthy movement that's instrumenting themselves. And then you've got this really incredible new science. And I just see the link logs starting to come together. And it really doesn't matter what they do in Washington, in a way. Tax, no tax, this. John, did you, I mean, do you really believe that? Because look, I mean, you've got $3 trillion. And that's not being spent on all this you know, gene editing and everything else. It's being no. spent on, you know, Pap people have diabetes that no one looks at the or, results yeah, of. heart disease and yeah. obesity epidemic and all of that. I mean, you've got that giant, you know, you know a lot of the $3 trillion is focused on basic care. This is, you know, and look, you and I, all, all of us, in fact, most people in this room are all into the you know, new innovative technologies. We talk about things like evolving ourselves and all that. But is that going to do an end run around this? I mean, the, clearly the system can't even handle what we've got now. I think a bunch now. of end runs coming. I mean, it's not, so it's, right now, it's, is it still a third, a third, a third? It's basically a 
I think you know this better than me. I'm making shit up, so just go like this. I'm like, <laughs> I think 92% of us spend a third on the commercial side. 92% of everybody spends a third. Whatever you say, Jonathan. Then, <laughs> then I think 6% of us spend the second third, and they're the you know they're your people, right? They're right. the Eat like a pig, smoke like a chimney, drink like a fish, you know, a lot of cake, and then soda, juices, right? And then there's 2% of us or 1% of us that are raging against the dying of the light, and we like that. You know, we had this bombing here, and bam, we got every single one of them that didn't die instantly. It felt great. You know, so whether we want to stop doing that or, you know, do it a little less or, you know, last will and testament earlier so we don't get punished the way Gawandi writes about so nicely. But really, like... Those first two thirds are, to me, in play with everything. We, we don't need any new thing. We don't need a better debate. We don't need to kill the tax or keep the tax. Like everything we need for those two chunks, uh, I don't know. I think we've got it. We just got to, you know, do. I yeah. think, yeah. don't we? But, you know, if this works, it's going to be because of people like that. Because truly, I mean, one of the great things about the world is you get these people who think, I'm going to take out Google, I'm going to take out Microsoft, they're in a 10-person office, they're about to go broke, yeah. and they build bloody things like you build. And, yeah, and that's what's so it, cool. It's not an end run. I mean, it's a Gordian knot, right? The famous, you know, in ancient times, you know, nobody can untie it. Alexander takes a sword, he just chops it with a big sword. So is that, is that what we do? I mean, who does that? I mean... Maybe incrementally, maybe Jonathan does, you know. Well, the interesting he, question he is where does it happen? Yeah. You can build huge countries in one generation. You could never do that before. Right. Right, because you can. new flags idea. Uh, I mean, it, it's just African incredible. guys are shooting up like a rock. You think of Africa, you don't think of business, and all of a sudden, wham. Yeah. Well, you didn't have to build a line telephone system. You don't right. have to build a grid system. You just go, and, and the fascinating thing is where is the stuff you're inventing going to take place first? Because yeah. The competitive advantage, if you can take 1% of GDP and make it more efficient, is absolutely enormous. Yeah, but and but it but really matters where you apply but it. But here's an opportunity. I mean, you mentioned Africa. So as they start exploiting their national, re, you know, national resources, obviously the major issues were communicable diseases. So what's happening now? All the fast food restaurants are coming into those countries, and they're now having a huge pandemic around diabetes. So, I mean, part of the Sausage argument is, over. yeah, but, but I mean, <laughs> why not get ahead of the curve? I mean, you know, in some ways, why are we going to deal with health when, in fact, we ought to be focusing on wellness? I mean, we know that people have a genetic predisposition. We know that they're environmental, food, and nutrition, and yet we kind of wait until someone has a health problem. Then we decide we're going to intervene. When in fact, we ought to basically be able to understand and screen and say, you know what, let's spend the money in the front end. And it's your point. Why not spend it on health promotion, prevention, and recognizing that, again, young people that uh, have a genetic risk factor, why do we want to let them just wait until they have a problem? And then we're going to pay for it. So I, I think we got to totally turn it on the other head. Well, that was one of our, you know, if you're the czar questions, uh, I think it was second or third, prevention. I mean, clearly we have the technology now to know a lot more about this. Right. And you and I talked about you know, prediabetes, right. which is, I mean, you think diabetes is bad. I mean, we're, we're looking at, you know, hundreds of millions of people globally. But um, so... We are Done. at the end of our, of our very short session. Yes. I mean, it, I, this is great. It's phenomenal, though. I mean, the shortness. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> well, you know, you, you stop before people start nodding off, basically, right? Okay. Especially as panelists. Yeah. yeah. <laughs>